recorded. And uh, the recording is made of is uh, complete immediately after we close out the session uh, at 1.15 or whatever time we finish. And then it will take me a day or so to, uh, to, to transfer that file to my secretary and have that put up on the web page. But within a very short amount of time, a recorded version of this presentation will be available. So um, let me start by uh, welcoming all of the participants and introducing myself. My name is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester working for Cornell University Cooperative Extension. Um, I'd like to welcome you. This is um, about 22 months into a, um, a process of using this web-based technology to, uh, to bring uh, information, research-based information to people who are interested in forest resources. And we have a, a great speaker today who I'll introduce in just one minute. Uh, before I uh, introduce Dr. Nyland, I'm going to uh, send you all, the participants, a, a link to an online web survey. So, I'm, And I'm just going to automatically, so it'll push out to your computer. If you have uh, pop-up blockers engaged, you'll need to, you'll probably be prompted to allow a pop-up from Bree, I think it's a Breeze site or a Cornell site. If you would please allow that um, online survey to come through, that's the way we collect information, kind of the exit survey. But I want to send that out now so that you can have it. The last, uh, last month we had about a 50% response rate. I hope that you all can, um, Humor me a bit more. I'd like to get up to an 80 or 90 percent response rate. So please take. It just takes. It's a very simple survey. Click through, and uh, and then hit submit, and that will come back to me, and I'm able to document the impacts that we're having through the use of this technology. So here it comes. All right. So that should show up in the background. You don't need to do anything with it now. I'll send it out again at the end of the presentation. Just wanted to get that started. Okay, with that, I'm going to uh, introduce our, our uh, speaker today is Dr. Ralph Nyland. Um, Ralph is a Distinguished Service Professor of Silviculture at the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse. Many of you know uh, Ralph because of his uh, extensive work in all areas of silviculture, but particularly um, related to diameter limit cutting and high grading. He's written about this for um, a very long time and, and um, has a, a great message to share with us. So with that, I am going to uh, turn the microphone over to Dr. Nyland, as it will, and he will, um, he's going to give a presentation. He will be um, responding. You can type in questions if you want into the chat pod as we move along, uh, but but uh, Dr. Nyland's going to be holding all questions until the end, so it may be as advantageous to to, to keep your um, questions um, kind of on a notepad, and then when you get ready to ask those questions, you can type them into the chat pod. You can type them in at any point. They'll be retained, and we can scroll back through, um, but it's your call. So with that, um, welcome, Dr. Nyland, and the uh, I'd say the floor is yours, but I'll say the, the internet airwaves are yours. Well, good day to everyone. Nice to have you all here. Uh, diameter limit cutting has been fairly common in the natural forests of eastern North America for as long as people extracted timber from these lands. In the 1980s, you remember, vast areas of uh, new forests that had regenerated on former agriculture sites, those reached operable status towards the latter part of the 1980s. And since that time, we've seen an expansion of diameter limit cutting to those second growth forests as well. So I would say that at the present time, diameter limit cutting is the most common approach in manipulating natural stands across eastern North America. North America, not just the United States. So let's, let's consider diameter limit cutting. Or is it on the future, or is it both? It, to me, conservation is the essence of dealing with resources now with a direct concern for the future. The Native Americans have said that uh, every time we take some action, we should think of the implications seven
seven generations into the future. That's the ultimate of uh, sustained yield operations. By contrast to that, exploitation means really using resources now without regard to the future. So it's an opportunistic opportunity. So it, to me, uh, it, it is, whoops, we, to me it is uh, silviculture that equates with conservation and forestry, and that's what separates forestry from exploitation. Thinking into the future while dealing with the forest at the present time. So let's think about the consequences of diameter limit cutting as a form of exploitation. And, and start by thinking of the implications for even-aged stands. I'm focusing really here on natural stands, and my emphasis will be on hardwood forests. Let's, let's consider uh, a few key features of even-aged stands. And I've illustrated here uh, crown thinning. Uh, that's one of the methods we can use in, in natural stands. A crown thinning releases trees of upper canopy positions ones of high quality, so that they grow better into the future, so that at the time the stand reaches maturity at rotations, then we will have abundant high quality timber. The bottom di diagram illustrates with the dash lines the trees we would take out, freeing trees of upper canopy positions. And you see here in illustration, this particular stand is in its third crown thinning and at about 100 years of age. If we look at the growth of trees in even age stands after thinning, uh, you see an important effect of crown position. Here, here are some 15-year post-thinning diameter growth figures that John LaRue put together and later uh, a group of us worked on. Notice that a dominant tree, upper canopy position, would add about 3 inches in diameter over a 15-year period and a co-dominant about 2 inches. Now look at the intermediates and, and the overtop trees in subordinate canopy positions. After thinning, after thinning, they grew substantially less well than the trees of upper canopy position. That's a key feature to remember when dealing with even age stands. These data from Marcus show the same thing. And, uh, and let's focus on the column for the 40 to 50 year range. Uh, you see that uh, he's expressed the, doth, the growth of dominance as 100%. And the co-dominants grow at 61% of the rate of dominance, 32% for the intermediates, and 16% for the overtop trees. Our data compare to that, two-thirds rate of growth for co-dominants, about half for intermediates, and a quarter for overtop trees. So that if we, if we take out the best trees, the dominants and co-dominants, then the growth will be impaired into the future. So it compromises the the production potential, whereas a crown thinning that focuses the growth potential on trees of upper canopy positions and of high quality optimizes the growth potential into the future. One other thing, if we look at the quality of trees in different crown positions, usually those in the intermediate and overtop classes have lower quality bowls. I show an extreme case, but this is a, a high graded even age stand where the intermediates and overtop trees have been left to grow into the future. So, a diameter limit cutting removes the biggest trees that grow the best. It releases ones of low crown positions, at least in even age stands. If we looked at the diameter distribution, here represented in the vertical axis by number of trees per acre, and the horizontal axis in tree diameter, you see that diameter limit cutting cuts off the big trees and leaves the smaller ones. So let's use this as a representation of an even age stand uh, and, and, and see what happens if we do a diameter limit cut taking out the bigger trees. The cross hatchments here are the ones we take out with the diameter limit cutting and there they go. So now we have a stand which is degraded in the sense of having the best ones taken out. But notice also the patchiness of the residual stand, an important feature of diameter limit cutting. And there's what we have left. They grow. We know they'll grow into the future, but at slow rates. 
So at some point we could come back and do another diameter limit cutting. Again, taking out the biggest trees that have virtual value. And there they go. Now what do we have left? Very little. In fact, the experiences we have in looking at stands given more than a single diameter limit cutting indicate that after the second cut there's not much left to operate. In fact, there's so little volume you can't get enough to sustain a rehabilitation cut to try to upgrade or change the character of the stand. A real example, this was a stand given a very heavy diamond limit cutting, one up in the western Adirondacks. Look at the poor quality of the trees that remain. Look at the, look at the epicormic branching that's formed on those intermediates that were suddenly released by heavy cutting. So, Diamond limit cutting is favoring the growth of the trees that are marked here in purple and taking out the trees that are marked in green. And with that, then, a substantial reduction in the growth potential of trees in the residual stand. Something like this. Or like this. And note here the patchy distribution of residuals as well as the poor quality. The tree just to the right of center with the broken top has not been taken out. And it has very little promise for the future. So we have a choice between diamond limit cutting that I will call exploitation and crown thinning that I will call conservation. Well, let's see what, what diameter limit cutting does to yields when we compare it to a stand that has been treated by crown thinning. I have two scenarios that we'll look at here. In the upper case, we will thin the stand once at about mid-rotation age, thin it a second time, and then at the end of a rotation, regenerate it by removing the entire standing crop by either clear cutting or shelterwood method. For the other case, we'll do three diameter limit cuttings. Now, for the crown thinning, I will control the intensity by using a relative density control. In this case, relying on the, uh, the approach that Marcus Ernst and Stout have articulated for northeastern uh, northern hardwoods. We'll cut it to 60% relative density let it regrow to 80, cut it back to 60, and let it regrow again. When I calculate volumes, I use these features, international quarter inch rule. Uh, I gave saw timber volume to all trees 12 inches and bigger. And for heights, they varied with tree diameter, as you see here. That's a fairly common pattern that we find at least in uh, New York State. So there are the three test stands. Essentially, I want to take each of these stands and apply the two management strategies to each, strategies to each one and then see what the outcomes would be. Note in the very right-hand column, the relative density was high. They're suitable for thinning. The mean diameter is high, suitable for thinning. Please, as we go through this, watch for the relative differences. Watch what happens between the time of the first thinning and rotation age and the degree of similarity or the degree of difference, rather than the absolute level of anything. You remember that simulations are good ways to lie. We try to make them honest, but we have to be really looking at relative differences rather than actual, absolute ones. So there's stand number one. You will see in the middle column the outputs from diameter limit cutting with the three entries. And on the right-hand columns, the output from the thinning. In in the course of a rotation, uh, we'd get about 9,500 board feet per acre using diameter limit cutting, about 12,500 from thinning, 1.3 times more. And note at the bottom, there will be additional cords of pulp wood that would, or fiber wood that would come out with the thinning. That would not be taken out with the diameter limit cutting. Here's stand two, similar difference, 1.22 times more volume from the crown thinning regime than from diamond limit cutting and stand three the same thing about one and a quarter times more volume coming from a regime that uses a thinning. So let's summarize that. <clears throat> you see here the differences in each case the the volumes realized over the hundred year period, a hundred and ten year period is greater with crown thinning. And more importantly, if I separate that volume into trees at least sixteen inches in bigger versus smaller, then you see that 71% to 75% of the volume is in these larger trees with the silviculture regime. That's important for hardwoods. 
because the 16 inch trees in bigger have the potential to be grade one trees and thus have higher value. And you'll see that show up as we look at the financial implications. These two diagrams, or sets of them, show the effect on the diameter distribution. Across the top, watch that as you move from left to right, watch how the upper end of the diameter distribution keeps moving right and moving right and moving right so that by the final entry we have trees as large as 20 or 22 inches or bigger. At the bottom you see the effect on, of diameter limit cutting on the diameter distribution and we're not really finding trees ever much above 12 or 14 inches in diameter. That's a big importance between these two. Well, what are the financial implications? I did this analysis in using 2003 uh, lumber prices. Uh, they'd be different today, certainly, with the way the markets are going. I assumed that each tree would the high, have the highest possible grade for its diameter. That's a very optimistic view, and it may actually give more uh, value to the diameter limit cut stands where we do no tending than to the thin stands where we do tending. So the stumpage prices are based on tree grades, tree by tree, based on lumber prices. And for simplicity, I've assumed that everything is sugar maple. That, that makes the uh, analysis less complicated. So here we go. With stand one, twice as much value comes from the uh, use of thinning over that period of time. That's saw timber value. And then there's another $240 worth of pulpwood if we set the price of pulpwood at $6. Here's stand two, 1.8 times more value from the thinning regime, and stand three about the same thing. So if we summarize those, you see uh, that the long-term gain from thinning in stand one is about 200 percent, double double the yield, and it's about 1.8 times for the other two stands. That's cash flow, or the amounts of money that a landowner would realize through the course of a rotation. I calculated present net worth. You remember that these calculations look at the flow of revenues into the future and, and show you what, would, what it's worth today at given rates of return. And any, any uh, calculation that shows a positive value indicates that you would earn that rate of reper return. So here, with 4, 5, and 6 percent, all of these treatments in all of the stands would have a positive present net worth, meaning that you'd get at least 4, 5, or 6 percent. It is true that the bold figures, which are the higher values, uh, are predominantly in the diamond limit cuts. And that's because we take all the real value out in the first entry. Now, these calculations presume that the landowner will immediately reinvest that money in an alternative that would pro pro provide the same rate, not that they would spend it. So you can make your, your choice here, uh, more cash flow, a, a positive uh, rate of return, or would you go with those bold figures? Let's add the pulpwood in and see what happens to the value. Here I've, I've used $10 a cord, <clears throat> and you see that uh, it increases the, uh, the cash flow a bit from uh, the thinning regime. The pulpwood really doesn't add a tremendous amount of value. It does shift somewhat which uh, options have the bold face figures, putting more into the thinning regimes for the 4%. And I've also now shortened the rotation to 90 years, which means I will do one thinning, and then 15 years later, uh, regenerate the stand. A and uh, this doesn't give you as much money as with the 110 or so year rotation, but the thinning regime is still ahead by 1.5 to 1.6 times. And, and you see here that the uh, they all have a positive present net worth, and, and this time the thinning tends to show up better at 4 and 5 percent. You can make your choices amongst whether you want money coming into the bank, uh, whether you want a positive uh, current rate, uh, value, or, or whether you really just want to have lesser money but a seemingly higher present net worth. It is true that the diameter limit cutting will give you greater cash with the first entry. It'll give you greater volume with the first entry. Uh, over the long run, there'll be less saw timber, about 80%. There'll be fewer high-grade saw logs, only about 10 to 15%, and there'll be about half as much cash flow value. Uh, one other feature here. 
Many of our even age stands have a component of uh, valuable shade tolerant trees like black cherry. And those would be in upper canopy positions. So if we apply diameter limit cutting in stands that have those black cherry, white ash, things like that, we essentially remove them from the stand. So that will reduce tree species diversity. And it means that when we come to the end of a rotation, we will not have that seed source for the future. Here's what it would look like. This is a case with diamond limit cutting. They took out the cherry, took out the ash. Notice the quality of the trees that are left behind, emphasizing the point I made earlier. This is, this is not a way to upgrade the potential for the stand into the future. Here's some other factors. Laura Kennefick does research with the diamond limit cutting and selection system up in uh, Maine with the Forest Service. And she's pointed out that when people do diamond limit cutting, again, there's no control over tree quality. You end up with stands with this patchy, irregular distribution of residual trees. It results in inefficient use of the growing space. There is evidence, in fact, that this is genetically degrading. The work been done in Vermont shows that stands given diamond limit cuttings have trees with a greater proportion of rare alleles or rare genes. And those rare genes tend to be associated with lower growth rates and poor stem characteristics. Diamond limit cutting can reduce species diversity, lose the seed source for the shade intolerance. The trees are always low vigor. And when you come to a time to regenerate the stand, you will have small trees of low vigor, poor seed production potential, and that may cause problems with regenerating a replacement cohort. There are other unknown opportunities that you've lost by doing this. So overall, with even eight stands, we have limited control limited consistency, and little long-term benefit in volumes or values. So we have a choice, one or the other. Well, now let's look at uh, uneven age stands. You know the story with these. The selection system is the silviculture for uneven aged stands, hardwoods and softwoods. The notion here is that there's a relationship between tree diameter and tree age. And we use the diameter distribution to control the age class distribution. And, and if we do that, if we create what's called a balance stand, as you see in the upper left of these four diagrams, by the time we come to the end of a cutting cycle, represented in lower right, we will have stability in the structural characteristics. We will have excess trees to cut out of the different diameter classes to bring it back to that balance condition. And that will provide for periodic yields of fairly common amounts. So the key of, of a balanced stand is that there's equal age class, equal area per age class, or approximately so. And if you have that, you get consistency in structure, in ecologic conditions, and yields through time. And the data support that notion. You see here an example of a uneven aged northern hardwood stand dominated by sugar maple that's had two selection system cuttings. And you see the, the diversity of sizes in diameters. Also note that the small trees tend to have short heights and the big trees tall heights. And that if you can pick out the amount of live crown ratio, the amount of foliage on these trees, it tends to be 40 to 60% for trees of all sizes. That supports good growth. Now what, is, what does diamond limit cutting do in these uneven age stands? Well, it removes the older age classes. It does no tending in the younger ones. So that it, there's no attempt to balance a stand to create this equal area per age class. And there's no attempt to focus the growth potential on the trees of the best quality. It simply takes out the big trees. And that reduces the spread of diameters. And also leaves this kind of apache distribution of trees as, as suggested by this diagram. Now, we, we can probably agree that even with diameter limit cutting, the younger age classes have in them trees of good growth potential, have trees of good quality. The only difference here is that in selection system, we would try to identify those trees in favor of their growth and development by reducing crowding. In diameter limit cutting, we don't do that. So diameter limit cutting, we, we don't balance the age arrangement. We don't 
work for any particular diameter distribution. We don't regulate the spacing between residual trees. We don't focus the growth on the trees of the best potential characteristics or quality or growth rates. And we may get regeneration, but the patterns of it will be irregular and unpredictable. You see here a sequence over time. And in fact, as I've watched stands that have been given repeated diameter limit cuttings, I see this conversion from what is a multi-structured stand at the top down to something that's quite even age-like in its structural characteristics eventually. Patchy, uncontrolled, poor quality, often with the buildup of undesirable species. Now this, this will result in a reduction in the sustainability, the consistency of yield through time, and, and I find in an actual reduction of yields through time. Let's, let's look at one reason for it. Uh, Benjamin Roach, many years ago, um, hypothesized what would happen to the diameter and age class distribution in stands given diameter limit cutting. Now, we use this reverse J type distribution to characterize uneven age stands, with the vertical axis being the number of trees per age class and the horizontal axis, their diameters representing their ages. Uh, the first diameter limit cut takes only the big trees out. The result of that is we get a growth across the diameter distribution, but we begin to see a change in the shape of the, of the diameter distribution or age class distribution. Uh, a second cutting, again, take the big trees out, and now we're finding that the small trees begin to diminish in their abundance, and those of the middle age or size classes begin to increase in abundance. We go in for a third cut, and this pot belly has formed. We've got an accumulation of trees in the middle diameter classes, often poles, and two possibilities with regeneration. If that abundance of poles builds to a sufficient level, it shades the ground extensively, and the numbers of recruits into the bottom of the diamond, new age classes, that begins to drop off. We find that in many cases, if the uh, cutting does not take all the saw timber sized trees out, perhaps using a 14 or 16 inch diameter limit, that we will get regeneration and we get some upward tail there on the left, but not a very big one. So this is the scenario that Roach has suggested through time, that, that we lose the structural characteristics moving to something that's quite pot belly like because of the lack of consistency, because of the lack of control. And, and you see in this simulation of a real stand how the, the structural characteristics change and how by the bottom right, the sixth entry, we've got that pot belly. In our case, the simulator shows that a new age class is due form. So there it is, patchy, uncontrolled, increase of poor quality trees proportionate to the numbers present. All right, let's look at the yields in, in these cases. And in this case, I had stands that had been cut recently. So we inventoried those stands. And that gave us uh, some starting diameter distributions. I want to simulate one cutting strategy per stand. And, and for this, I've gone back to the cut tree data. We knew what was cut from a stand, and I've used that to define the cutting strategy that had been used with the previous entry. So I want to repeat that again. And I'm going to assess the effects from multiple entries over a 90 to 100 year period of time. So here are the six cases. The three top stands had been given diameter limit cuttings. One of them to 14 inches, uh, the other two 16 inches and bigger. And note with that, there are variable length cutting intervals, 20, 25, or 30 years. So all the trees above those threshold, of those threshold diameters and greater were cut. The three stands on the bottom are all selection system stands. These are, these are all northern hardwoods. And in this case, uh, we cut to the residual diameter distribution recommended by Carl Arbogast based on the work of Aaron Zilgut. These each allowed a 15-year cutting entry. See here the volumes taken out of the diameter limit cuts over the 100 or 90 year period. And note that uh, there's a variable volume per acre, 
but also variable amounts of trees 16 inches and bigger. It depends much upon the trees that are below that 16 inch threshold and how many grow above the 16 inch threshold. Here are the three selection system stands, higher volumes, more consistent volumes, and in this case about 90% of all the volume taken out is in trees 16 inches and bigger, and that's going to show up later in the values. Here they are for the three diameter limit cut stands, 11 to 12 or 11 to 13,000. For the selection system stands, 15 to 17,000. Now remember, these are for differing periods of time. The top two lines apply to 100-year periods, and the bottom four lines apply to 90-year periods. So we have to equalize this to make sense out of it. And that's, that's the next chart. Here I've taken the volumes and values and divided them through by the uh, simulation period. And, and this shows me that on average the diameter limit cut stands yielded about 220 board feet per acre per year and about $125 per acre per year. Note the degree of variability indicated by the SD, the standard deviation. Whoops, Peter, we went here. Sorry. There we go. Note that uh, in this case, the average is uh, 273 uh, board feet per acre per year, and the value of $177. And the, the variability has been reduced so that there's more consistency from one stand to the next. Let, let's summarize the averages here. The difference between diameter limit cutting and selection system is about 52 board feet per acre per year. And that's about $53 per acre per year. If the stand covered 10 acres, that's $500 per acre or per year. If it was 100 acres, that's $5,000 per year. And if it's 1,000 acres, that's $50,000 a year. Present net worth uh, shows positive for all these alternatives, diameter limit cutting and selection system, and the higher present net worth values are all associated with selection system silviculture. So to summarize, we get greater saw timber removal with the first entry, higher first entry revenues, uh, and a greatly reduced residual stand value. Over the long run, we, we realize less volume with the diamond limit cutting, only about 80% as much. We have only, we have one and a half to two times fewer high quality saw logs, and we have only about 75% of the revenues coming into a landowner. So with the, with the silviculture, you gain by consistency in, in volumes and values by cutting across the diameter distribution to sustain the yields and sustain the production through time. Other factors, I'm mimicking the things that Kenefek has described. Again, the patchy distribution of residual trees leading to inefficient use of growing space, an irregular interval between cuttings, uh, inconsistent release of small trees so that some are greatly exposed and some are remain crowded. We, we can't sustain the structure through time and that means we'll get inconsistent values across time. We don't control tree quality and get more poor quality trees. If we do a low diameter limit, 12 or 14 inches, there'll be very limited amounts of seed source and that may affect distribution of regeneration into the future in addition some unknown costs that we can't quite quantify. So what do you have? Again, chaos or organization. Well, how do overall these diameter limit cuttings compare to civil culture for both even and uneven age stands? In both cases, we get less volume from diameter limit cutting. We get fewer large diameter trees from diameter limit cutting. We get more first entry cash but lower long-term revenues from diameter limit cutting. And that applies both to even and to uneven age stands. Let me digress here away from volumes and values and share with you an observation uh, in some stands here in New York State following the recent severe defoliation by forest tent caterpillar. 
These stands had a light to moderate defoliation followed by a year of complete defoliation. And that's what the stands look like <clears throat> after the complete defoliation. This is during uh, early July of the year, as I remember. Up in the western Adirondacks, we had some thinning plots that uh, where we'd use crown thinning. And one year later, when I returned to check those plots, the foliage had returned to the trees. You see the in the upper right, there still is some gaps between them, but the crowns were recovering uh, seemingly nicely. Adjacent to those was an area that had been given diameter limit cutting. The big trees had been removed. You see here the patchiness. You see the in the lower left the poor qualities of trees that remained. And in the upper right, how the dieback had affected so many trees within the residual stand. This is one year after the heavy defoliation. The lower left shows the boundary between the area of given crown thin. Let's go to the central New York, uh, south of Syracuse. This is a even age stand that had three crown thinnings. It's about 110 years of age at the time I took the photograph. This is the stand two years after the heavy defoliation. Adjacent to it was a, a, an area that the, the landowner had cut by taking out the big trees each time and pretending this was an even age, uneven age stand. So they'd taken out the big trees and done some moderate amount of tending in the smaller size class, essentially removing the dominance and co-dominance through time. You see the dieback present two years after cutting. There's a difference between the stand that had been given silviculture on the left and the diameter of cutting on the right. This, this diameter limit stand required extensive salvage cutting to recover whatever volume was there before it deteriorated. So the, the anecdotal experience I have suggests that stands which have been subjected to diameter limit cutting or exploitative cutting of some kind did not withstand the defoliation. They were less resilient, less recovery. The stands I showed you were paired on similar sites. Uh, when I looked at large areas given this uh, kind of treatment, I found that the, the diebacks, uh, the losses were more severe where the soils were shallow in the southern exposure. Well, we can make our choices. We have uh, that between civil culture or diamond limit cutting. Consider this, even aid civil culture, uneven aid civil culture, even age diameter limit cutting, uneven age diameter limit cutting. And it raises the question, which side of the mountain should we stand on? What's the right course of action? It's an important choice we all make in helping people learn how to manage their lands. Those are my comments. So I'll be glad to uh, respond. Peter, why don't you tell me what to do next? You are. <laughs> okay, thank you. Am I turned on? Good. <laughs> I never know if I'm. I know I'm talking. I don't. I know I'm talking. I don't know if anybody can hear me. <laughs> um, Trying to find them. That's right great, now. Ralph. Wonderful presentation. Um, I see that we have um, a couple oh, treat, yeah. questions. One from Chad and one from Martis. And let me. Oh see. yes, thank you, Peter. Well, they're in the chat pod, and you, if I remember, you have one. You have one more slide. So here's some some citations that we'll put up in case people want people want to be able to look up some of these references. I'll also point out that that there were two uh, PDF files on the Forest Connect website associated with this presentation. So. Um, uh, if you want some additional reading, those are available online. I'm going to, before you uh, put more questions in, let me make this a little bit bigger so that we can see the questions. And then, uh, uh, Ralph, I'll let you scroll up and yes, down in the chat pod. I, I don't. first question I yeah, see. I don't have a lot of information in chat, chat about that. About trunk um, taper the notion is Chad that most of the growth occurs at the base of the crown. 
but the base of the crown was also down low and and it may very well be that trees in managed stands by virtue of the of the better diameter growth lower in the bowl uh, actually have more taper uh, I, I don't know that uh, diameter limit cutting has much of a different effect on this so I can't provide much information there sorry um, then uh, Martis asks about doing uh, essentially thinning from below in even eight stands if you take out all the small trees and and leave the big ones uh, I, I only make this comment that uh, thinning from below in even eight stands has uh, a history that goes way back in European practices before we even thought about forestry here the the uh, the practices started from people wanting to recover small pieces of wood for fuel and uh, other uses around the home if you take out only the small trees and don't break apart the continuity of the upper canopy you see no positive effect in in growth rates of the upper canopy trees so through time people have really argued that if you want to do thinnings from below you need to do at least a what's called a C grade thinning from below taking all the overtop trees all the intermediate trees and some of the codominants and strive for uniform spacing within the upper canopy so that you you've illuminated the crowns of the residual trees that means you keep the lower branches alive and they get wider you fix the base of the crown and as the tree grows in height the crown gets longer and in hardwoods anyway the added light around the foliage often results in a more dense foliage within the crown so you get a three-dimensional improvement wider taller denser crowns and that results in uh, uh, more growth at uh, at breast height and that's a, that could be realized with with uh, thinning from below it's what we get with crown thinning I don't know what more to say uh, about that um, the next one says what do you do if this forest has been high graded and how, how go about remediation of that if you come back in uh, what is it a a April right we're going to do a session about uh, rehabilitating cutover stands and and essentially Two the months. choices you have depend upon how badly the yes, original stand has been affected by the diamond limit cutting but I'd like to hold off my comments until then because it takes uh, quite a bit of time for me to explain it uh, Paul uh, Bill now uh, yeah, I've I've uh, uh, I've had a chance to see a lot of high graded stands, and the the perplexity uh, comes with with looking in those stands and knowing that you need to rehabilitate them, but not finding sufficient volume to even do a salvage cutting, or not finding that the trees are uh, good enough to support to gain any interest from people doing salvage cutting uh, let, let's uh, let's hold that one off also in, until the next presentation and and uh, I want to I want to uh, articulate what I think are some of the options including some ideas that are coming out of John Martin Lucier up in Quebec where he's experimented with options to do with mechanized harvesting uh, that may allow uh, us to recover uh, more of the smaller and poor quality trees yeah, now uh, Lee wants to know about the habitat for wildlife. Well, Lee, I don't know of anyone who has really studied uh, the non-market effects of diamond limit cutting. Uh, we do know from studies of songbirds that any cutting you do opens up the canopy, brightens the understory, and, and the result of that is you usually do find an increase in songbird species diversity. Uh, there may also be an increase in the abundance of singing males heard early in the breeding season and then as the canopy closes again the uh, the population of songbirds the community tends to go back towards what it was pre-cut I suppose you could argue that any cutting that opens up the forest dramatically and reduces the stand density dramatically you will see that effect persisting for longer periods of time I, I guess the the only other comment I'd make is that when I talk to 
wildlife biologists, they begin to articulate specific kinds of things that should be present in the forest to support a particular species or community of them. And, and the only way to get that is controlled cutting, which creates certain predictable kinds of responses that lead to certain kinds of vegetational characteristics. With diamond limit cutting, you may or may not create those. So I, I guess I would feel better knowing that I used a controlled cutting to create specific kinds of habitat changes rather than to do diamond limit cutting and hope it works out well. Uh, Richard. Yeah, let's, let's uh, you're again asking a question that I want to deal with in the, uh, the next presentation. In these degraded stands, particularly the even age ones, there's really not much except pulpwood or firewood left. Uh, and one of the hopes that some of us have that the biomass markets will in fact improve so that uh, would open up better opportunities for dealing with these degraded stands. I, I can't say more at the present time, I guess. Uh, Oh, about a shoestring fungus, uh, uh, armillarias. Uh, armillaria fungus uh, gets into trees through injuries to the root system, and, and it builds up in um, the, the dead parts of trees left behind the stumps and the root systems. Anytime uh, we do damage to a tree, in particular to the root system, we've opened up an entree court for armillaria to uh, get into another tree. I see with uh, diamond limit cutting often, uh, not a lot of interest in controlling logging operations. So you end up getting a high proportion of skid trails across the area and often deeply cut skid trails if the logging takes place in times when the soils are saturated. That, that means you could get an increase in the entry courts for, for armillaria as root wounds increase. The armillaries are there. There are several species of them and some of them are quite virulent in in hardwoods, some of them are quite virulent softwoods, and some of them uh, are less so. It, it's a it's a matter to be concerned about, and the only thing I've heard the, the biologists urge is to be careful in not creating wounds within the trees, not severing those root systems, to, which, which would automatically increase the entry courts for these things. Greg wants to know about taxes. Uh, Yeah, there, there is a uh, there's a lot of things going on today with uh, breaking parcelization. I call it breaking apart larger properties and smaller ones. The real estate market has has boomed in the past, has encouraged that, and there seems not to be much uh, dedication of landowners to the future. Uh, they they when they sell the land, they want to subdivide it. The last thing to do is take off whatever value is there, pass it on to someone else in a degraded situation. I can't say much more than that. It's if You referred to the 480 tax law, which is in New York State, but tax laws often are uh, set up so that they encourage long-term thinking of maintaining a stands into the future, of having a long-term perspective and practicing civil culture. So I would think that that if people try to take advantage of these tax laws, they're committing to a long-term management, and, and if they're doing that, then diamond limit cutting makes no sense, at least from the perspectives that that I have. And I guess I'm, this is not an area of my expertise, so I, I don't think I want to accommodate for Ron. Hi, Ron. Ron wants to know, do cherry trees germinate? Uh, I don't get the rest of the sentence, but cherry, cherry uh, has good seed crops about every three, maybe every four years. And uh, the, according to the work that Marquis and Grise did in Pennsylvania, most of those uh, cherry pits germinate in the first year. Uh, the, you have to uh, get the, the fleshy material rotted away, and that happens by having them lay over in the litter layer over the winter. The uh, some people feel that the uh, cutting, which brightens the understory, warms the litter layer, releases some nitrogen in decomposition, and that 
may help to uh, trigger cherry germination, but I'm not the expert in that. So I won't say any more. Yeah, and, and Andrew asks about the uh, genetic differences. Uh, that's the work which went on in, uh, in Vermont. Um, if you go into the uh, proceedings of the, of the dime, uh, Dimer Limit Cutting Conference that Laura Kennefick had organized at the University of Massachusetts uh, in 2005 or 6, uh, you can find that referenced on the U.S. Forest Service uh, publication list through the Northern Research Station. It's a general technical report. And in there, you'll find an abstract that uh, deals with that subject. We are beginning to see more and more information that uh, degraded stands. There is there is an effect on the genetic quality, and particularly with heavy cutting, that reduces the small trees, the the, the large trees, to great amounts in uh, even age stands. Uh, I, we can get you, if if you send me a message, I can give you some actual references to that. Um, I guess Terry is referring to this arbogas distribution where where in uneven age stands the uh, work in the upper lake states back in the 40s recommended a 24 inch maximum diameter as being financially mature. I, f I find that today uh, with the financial situation different owners have that uh, the diameter for financial maturity may be set anywhere between 20 and 24 inches, and in some cases of industrial ownerships is as low as 17 or 18 inches. It really doesn't matter where you set that maximum diameter for financial maturity in uneven age stands, as long as you maintain a balance in the distribution of trees amongst the younger age classes, and that you, you match the cutting interval to the residual density. In other words, give the stand long enough time to rebuild into the future. The financial advantage of those low density stands with, uh, say, a maximum diameter set at 16 inches, you have less residual value and they tend to come up uh, looking better in financial analysis where people are dedicated to return on investment criteria. Uh, with, with even age stands, remember there is no such thing as a financial maturity for an individual tree. The whole stand reaches financial maturity at some point, and once that occurs, then you regenerate the entire even age stand using shelter wood or clear cutting methods, whichever appropriate. Um, now, uh, Al wants. I, I think if you look at the saw timber classes, diamond limit cutting takes out more saw timber sized trees than does crown thinning. Uh, crown thinning will take some trees out of the pole classes uh, because it wants to free the lower parts of crowns of upper canopy trees. And, and by virtue of that, there may be more trees taken. I'd have to actually look at an analysis. A lot will depend upon how the trees are distributed amongst the size classes going into the thinning. The older the stand when you do your first thinning, the fewer trees there will be in the pole classes, and the fewer trees there'll be per acre. The younger you start, the more trees there'll be in the smaller classes and the more per acre. So how many you take out with these two methods depends upon the stage of development of the stand, but would depend upon looking at the actual diameter distributions themselves. Yeah, uh, Alice, uh, Richard is asking about uh, cutting to reverse J distribution. Uh, I, th I think I would only make this comment that we ought, we ought not to depend on the logging contractor to make the silviculture prescription. Uh, they have skills that are involved with uh, cutting, skidding, hauling safely and efficiently the trees that we want to remove from the forest. And the role of the forester ought to be to, to analyze the stand, to compare what's there to what the owner would like to have, to look at the long-term potentials for development, and then decide how the cutting strategy should be. 
And if the contract doesn't want to cut according to that, then we have to find another contractor. I've found that when we have high quality trees to offer uh, among the larger diameter classes, that the contractors are never unwilling to cut a few small trees. And, and in, in the uneven age stands I work with, the number of small trees that cut is really not that number. It's not as many as people tend to suggest. Uh, yeah, uh, Martis is asking about beach. Well, uh, beach is uh, and beach is uh, essentially gone in in a way from our forest as the beach bark disease is spread across northeastern North America. The large beach have been killed off. Uh, initially, beech nut production crashed. Importantly, there's some signs that as the uh, trees move into pole size. Uh, so, root suckers that we're getting beech nut production on them. They are the same clone. They may be reproductively mature because of that. But but beech is uh, in at least in the northeastern forest, beech is not a good species to manage. One would hope to find trees that have a tolerance or resistance, and and that you can maintain a component of them for wildlife habitat values and species diversity, but. Beach is uh, a lost system. I, I'm not an expert on, on oaks. I know that the that the animals of all kinds consume large amounts of beech nut and acorns when they're available, and that uh, acorn weevil destroys a lot of acorns that fall to the ground. But I'm going to shy away from making any more comments about about oaks. Uh, Fred wants to know if we're seeing greater use of diamond limit cutting, and that's true. The it's hard not to find it. Uh, it's it's become rampant in northeastern North America. I've had chances to work up and go up into Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, as well as New England, New York, out in the Lake States. I'm not going much farther south of Pennsylvania, but but I see. Uh, Diamond limit cutting is the method of choice throughout. And on all kinds of ownerships, even the ones that are rather surprising to see exploitation going on. Uh, Bruce asked us about the, uh, the use of diamond limit cutting in coniferous forests. That's the work that Laura Kennefick has been doing in the mixed conifer forests of southern New England. And, and she finds. Uh, that the the effects on yields, quality, and all those things are uh, about the same as I've articulated. In fact, Laura has actually measured these things in stands that have given three diameter limit cuttings and three selection system cuttings. And and I've been encouraged that uh, the simulations that I've done show essentially the same pattern that that Laura has articulated. Real data. Again, if you if you get a copy of the Proceedings from the Diameter Limit Cutting Symposium, published through the Northern Research Station. There's a paper in there by Laura Kennefick where she summarizes what they've learned about effects of diamond limit cutting in northern conifer stands. Um, Ralph is talking about uh, diamond limit cutting with reserves. I, I'm not an advocate of things like that, but I will agree that if you if you keep good trees, some of those dominants and upper co-dominants, toward the end of the rotation, you will retain a seed source. I guess I wouldn't say more than that. I agree that's true. Now, Lynn's comment about present net worth. Um, Remember, I'm a silviculturist and uh, not an economist. And um, I, I think, the, if I understand it correctly, the the advantage that goes in the in the present net worth calculations for the even age stands, the advantage that goes to the diamond limit cuttings comes because you get a big flow of money with the first occasion, and carry very little residual value in the forest. That's compared to getting nominal amounts of Revenues from the first entry with ground thinning, carrying high amounts of plays, and getting your your primary value later on in the rotation. So it, it's probably based on the characteristics of the 
the analysis. We're, we're trying to get started with some more complicated elect, uh, financial analyses and hope that within a couple of years we'll be able to answer your question better. I can't make any more comment to Andrew's uh, thing about uh, 70 year old sugar maple. Uh, I, I would have to refer you to the uh, genetics people for that. And there's, there's Brian Lockhart. I, I know Brian has really been concerned about uh, it, it, spreading the word about the effects of different cutting strategies and, and the implications in the long term. And I would make this comment, Brian, that we're never going to help landowners understand these implications until the forestry community comes to grips with it. And begins to dialogue amongst itself over the advantages and disadvantages and and comes to a point where it will seriously dialogue with landowners to explain the options so that landowners make uh, informed choices. So I think that the, the education in a sense has to start with a serious discussions among forestry professionals and uh, better understanding amongst all of us uh, how these things play out in the future in the long run. Um, you know, certification, I, uh, I, I have to say that I've seen some certified lands but on them where the, the history has been diameter limit cutting. It just bothers me uh, what we're certifying there, and I won't say any more than that. And I'll let I'll let Peter answer the last question because I think that perhaps the bell is wrong here, Peter. Well, this question is for um, you. So no, I'm... the bell. Well, it's one o'clock, um, and I'm on a different website. I'm checking to the question there. Oh, uh, from Bill. Okay, um, there uh, there have been 33 surveys already turned in. I just checked the website. So um, when you hit the finish button, it says nothing happens. Comes back on the screen. Is this normal? No. You should get a something that says thank you for taking the survey. Um, I did a I did a test on that, and my response was thank you for taking the survey. So I would say. Uh, Click the answer. <laughs> Click finish again. Um, I've had 33 responses come in, so the uh, the survey seems to be working. Um, but I have experienced it at previous times, not with this particular survey, that that happened. So try clicking finish again. Um, all right. And Tom says he doesn't see the survey. It may be opened up in a different window. I'm going to push the survey out one more time. I know that there are some of you who have multiple people uh, present at your at one location. If you could please forward the web link, uh, the website associated with the survey to all of the participants, that will help um, capture the. Um, capture the attitudes and perceptions of all of the participants. So, Peter, look at the last. There, I question. just sent out the survey again. Um, uh, Pimo asked about f the FLEP programs. FLEP was a cost share technical assistance education program of the previous Farm Bill. The current Farm Bill does include funding for private forestry programs for technical assistance and cost share assistance. Those will be, uh, those programs are going to be, uh, the funding at least for those programs is going to be administered through the Natural Resources Conservation Service. I know in New York the NRCS is working with DEC. DEC is going to be managing the technical assistance uh, and uh, NRCS is going to be managing the financial assistance programs. To my knowledge, they have not decided exactly what kinds of practices they're going to be funding. I believe they're going to be funding some plan writing practices as well as timber stand improvement practices. So I would say look to, it's correct, Keith says it's going to be under the EQIP. FLEP no longer exists. So I would say um, get in contact with the 
uh, with your NRCS office, especially the state level office, and find out how that's going to look in your particular state because each state has From some Lee flexibility Crocker. in how that is managed. Uh, okay, Ralph, there's a uh, yeah, I, I think uh, Lee and I are agreeing uh, well, I that uh, diamond Lee limit Crocker, cutting right. has been the common method. It's not just Ohio; it's uh, it's essentially everywhere. I I would argue you you can hardly drive the roads of northeastern North America without seeing it. And and if if I've heard Brian Lockhart correctly in the past, you it's that's true for the natural forests of southeastern North America as well. Um, I find that. Uh, in even age stands, the trees 12 inches and bigger are cut, with one exception. At some times, the, the value of two and three common lumber is so low that the, the, uh, it costs more to cut, fell, skid, and process a 12 inch tree than, than the value of the lumber in it. So at times when there's a low demand for, for these low grade boards for pallets and other uses, then People may not cut the 12-inch trees, but once those the values of that low-grade lumber increase uh, and, and the 12-inch trees get a positive value, then they'll start cutting them. Or, in some cases, they'll cut down a 12-inch tree and just take an 8-foot lock out of the butt, and, and that may have a positive value. Um, oh, there's, oh, I'm seeing Peter's screen now. Yeah, but that's all I see now. <laughs> so I won't be able to comment any more questions. <laughs> You're seeing the web survey? Because uh, <laughs> I've, I've, <laughs> I've, I've sent it out about three or four times. How about I will, um, what I'll do is I will, I will take the, the website link for the survey and send it to the entire uh, uh, web cast web conference listserv. So if you received the sign-up information for this particular presentation, everybody's going to get that, that same survey. So in case some of you aren't getting it, for whatever reason, your system doesn't allow me to push the website onto your screen, I'll send it out um, in an email, directly in an email. So I'll, uh, I'll apologize to the other people that uh, we have about 1,100 people in the database. We had about 100 show up today. So the other thousand people that missed this presentation will also get a chance to comment on that survey. Um, as John says, his survey's cut out four times before he finished. Hmm. I'd, I'd say keep trying. Uh, maybe wait until you get the email on the survey uh, and see if that works. So, well, why don't, uh, we're a few minutes after one o'clock. I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, thank again Dr. Nyland for giving this presentation um, and to remind you all, several of you were very interested in uh, knowing now how to rehabilitate uh, high graded stands, diamond limit stands. Um, and I'll just tell you to put uh, April 15th on your calendar. Um, if you've already registered into the forestry uh, webinar series, then you're then you're good. Um, you'll you're you're you'll receive notification of all future um, Forest Connect web conferences, and uh, just keep that date on your calendar and plan to come back. And Dr. Nyland has a, a presentation that deals with rehabilitating um, cutover stands. So um, with that, I'll thank all the participants all right, as here. well, and. Um, uh, I'll welcome uh, Ralph back Bye, tonight everybody. at seven o'clock. Keep warm. So have a great, great. Have a have a great afternoon, everyone.